and welcome to the sunny sunset safari a bit of a surprise considering the very soggy safari we had this morning my name is taylor mccurdy and on camera with me today is sebastian and we are not wet today. Voila, we are a little bit damp because we're now sweating. We, can't, we just can't win, hey, Seb? We just seem to be losing out all the time. Now, for those of you who have never joined us on a live safari before, this is what I look like when the sun burns my eyeballs. But you can also hashtag safari live on Twitter if you'd like to chat to us. Uh, or you can also use the YouTube chat. But on we go. Now, we didn't really get a chance to show you how full the dams were today. So that's going to be a plan. And I have a sneaky suspicion, hopefully my suspicion is going to be correct in thinking that if I'm hot, the elephants must be hot. So hopefully they're going to want to come and splash around in the water. So we're going to pop past Pangolin Track and have a look at those big mud wallows and see how full they are now. Then check Chele Pan, Twin Dams, and we'll eventually do a big loop around and have a scratch uh, up here. It's uh, Treehouse Dam, which is just down that way, but we, we're going to go around and round and round. Or... The other thing is, as I know Brent is going to be driving sort of towards Biffle's hook side, and then a little bit later he's going to come and scratch for the Avoca males, as I think Rusty's going to win with Signal down there. That seems to be the strongest car at the moment. Touch wood, let's not jinx it though, Taylor. Silly Billy. And so we, I did see a couple of elephants on Hyena Road, and I know there's some great mud wallows there. So maybe if Brent is preoccupied, perhaps he finds Tandy, uh, then we can sneak on in there and grab those ellies up. So that is our plan this afternoon. I, I'm really just hoping to fill it with elephants. Listen, if we can get a leopard or a lion, that's a great, it'll be fantastic. But I would just like to see how happy the animals are after freezing to death this morning, like we did. But now we're warm, clothes are all dry, and all these wonderful things. Right, off you go across uh, to Brent, and, uh, well, wish him the best of luck as he tries to find Tandy. Well, welcome to this beautiful blue and sunny sunset safari. Uh, my name is Brent Leo Smith and I think I've just seen a track. Now, I, I'm not going to go to the, the male lines just yet. Uh, it is a hyena. I've got David on camera with me today uh, and his luscious dimples. And uh, we'll see what we can find. Uh, so I think I'm going to head down towards Buffalo Dam first. Um, we last heard that it's possible that Tandy um, was in Torchwood and she got chased by and her kill stolen by quarantine. It could also have been Kuchava, so we're not 100% sure. So I'm just going to have a quick look around Cheetah Cutline. Ooh. Oh, that's not good. I've just heard Tandy is was seen crossing from Juma into Torchwood after drive this morning but we've got a beautiful bird if you got it no no Darby oh it was in the, the the tree with no leaves um it's just flown to the back let's see if we can get it it was a paradise wider very pretty bird let's see if we can spot it again And luckily not. Okay, let's keep moving. Okay, so I just heard that Tandy was actually seen crossing, well, not seen crossing, was seen in Torchwood by Aubrey after we finished drive this morning. So that's very interesting. Now, no sign of the cub with her, which means the cub is probably still inside Juma in that, those thickets. So we might take a little double around Galago Pan. Uh, and then as it gets cooler today, we'll head down towards where the Evoca male lions are. Monique is, well, since we're talking about lions, Monique was asking about the lone lioness. Have there been any updates? Not that I've heard, Monique, unfortunately. Uh, she crossed south and I haven't heard anything since then. Um, I think the birding this afternoon should be quite good. And uh, now that the, there might be some insects out, hopefully some butterflies as well. So ooh, we'll see what wonders await. Now remember, if you want to ask any questions like Monique just did, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can just pop it in the feed below, whichever you are watching. 
Now, of course, you've seen Taylor, you've seen me, and now let's go to Tristan to see what his plans are for the afternoon. Well, my plans for this afternoon, Brent Leo Smith, is one, to stay and revel in the sunshine, and two, to hopefully find a spotted cat. But good afternoon, everybody. As Brent mentioned, my name is Tristan, and on camera, I've got VM, the wildebeest. And as you know, when the two of us are together, it really becomes mostly about spots more than anything else else so hopefully we will be successful we're going to go to chitra and try and see if we can find where hosana went from last night when he finished his kill and see whether or not he's hanging around at the dam but while we were kind of going down we managed to spot two birds as brent was saying it's going to be a good day for birding and so there are two gray go away birds that are sitting beautifully against the brilliant blue sky that we have at the moment and it makes such a change from what we saw this morning this morning was gray miserable rain and now we have the most brilliant blue sky in which to be a great backdrop for a lot of our birds and these particular guys are not the prettiest bird we get out here but they have character and they always up to something and so that's why i enjoy actually watching them and seeing how they go about their business they're very cool guys and they are going to be probably quite happy that there's been a bit of rain there's still a few trees that have some fruit on them and they are big exponents of fruit trees particularly even the jackalberries you find them a lot in jackalberry trees and i know some of the jackalberries at the moment are fruiting which is which is nice for them so they're going to be making hay at the moment good let's carry on let's continue marching slowly towards chitwa So, Paul, we don't have any rain totals for Juma itself, but from the gate, which is pretty much on Juma's northwestern point, it was 20 millimeters of rain, which is not very much, as much as it looked like. And then south of us on Nkoro, there was 20. And then through the rest of the river, in 40 and 19. So everyone got a rough, roughly around the mid 20s up into the 30s. So it was a pretty even spread. Now, I'm going to go through a little dip and I'm in Jigger. I've swapped with Taylor. So she's got Wendy, I've got Jigger. And Jigger is probably the worst performer this afternoon. So while, before we go through this dip, let's send you across to Taylor and we'll carry on towards Chitla. Well. I haven't got fantastic news for you just yet because I checked the mud wallows on Pangolin Track. Nothing. That's full. I checked Chele Pan. No frogs. Not even an animal. Not even a bird having a sip of water today. Can you believe it? So, next up is Treehouse Dam. Not too far to go. We're just on the start of Elephant Carcass now. And then we jump over Weaver's Nest and then we carry on. And then we get to the house down. But this is a really good area. This is often where we found Osana and this drainage line. We've seen Tundi here quite a few times, in fact. So I suppose we can't give up. And on a hot day like today, with all the different dynamics that are going on with, um, well, the leopards and lions, Tundi creeping to the east, hiding away. Then we've got Shadow and her youngster disappearing. We've got a kudu, though, that hopefully won't act like the leopards and disappear. No! <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? Huh. Well, yeah, that was a kudu, everybody. I promise. How's my luck? Amazing. I'm winning on safari. Anyways, we'll just keep up. Same as this morning and the day before that and the day before that. But we'll just carry on. Um, so... Everybody seems to be a little bit nervous to be around. I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near the Zavoka males at the moment. If I was a young lion or a lioness with youngsters, I wouldn't want to be a female leopard with a young cub at the moment with Hukumuri prancing about, causing fights. I mean, did you guys all see the pictures of the Anderson male? Got a nice hole in his uh, lip and a hole in his ear. So, um, I'm now listening to Sebastian. What are you talking about, Sebastian? Are you talking to Nikki? You're having secret conversations. They have secret conversations now. The directors don't even want to tell us these things anymore. They just go, ah, apparently I'm sounding a bit strained. I best, okay, I won't change my tone too much. I will speak in a calm voice. This is my calm voice. This is what I sound like when I'm calm, which is never. This is fake. This is a fake voice. If you hear me doing this, I'm not being real. This, oh, and I'm just showing you, I just wanted to give FC a fright and change my voice dramatically. Um, so yeah, so I think that's why everybody has sort of gone 
and disappeared slightly. I would like to see Hukumuri, though, after that altercation. Uh, no one obviously saw the fight between the Anderson male and Hukumuri. It would be quite interesting to see if he, um, our dear friend, the man with the, the looks that could kill, if he got any scratches. I would assume he did. I would imagine so. They obviously did one of those things where a leopard turns into a tumbleweed and they, you know, they just blow in the wind. And all you see is tails and you hear growling and all sorts of noises. Um, so that must have happened. Oh, Treehouse Dam is just up ahead. And, and then I've heard the whispers in the wind say that the uh, Birmingham boys are on their way back up north. Apparently, they are in Mala Mala at the moment. Three of them. So that's exciting. Are they coming home? Have they heard what's going on in the north? They're coming to save the cub of the Inkuhumas, protect the Styx pride, or oh, perhaps just pop past for a cup of tea with the Torchwood pride, because I don't seem to spend much time with them anymore either. Oh, look at all these creatures. Hello, creatures. Shh. Goodness, yeah, I think you're being a drama queen. I see you every single day, Blacksmith Lapwing. No need to alarm like that. Well, there's, there's uh, the Terrapins that are actually more entertaining than the Blacksmith Lapwing. Thank you, Seb. I was just having a word with that bird. But there were about 30 other Terrapins of varying sizes. There it goes. Are we going to do turtle diving again? Remember we did that one day at Buffalo's Hook Dam? Going in low. Is it going to do a push off? Maybe it's going to do... Oh, it's waving first. Waving to the crowd this afternoon. <laughs> Say hello to your fans. <laughs> off it goes. Slow to start with. Oh, very graceful. From Turnip the Turtle. Well done. <laughs> That's all <laughs> That was so cool. I don't know why that terrapin was doing that with its foot. I can't say that I've ever seen that happen in my entire life before. But at least it's provided, providing much entertainment for the day. And you know what? I like that. I like it when the animals are silly to me. Now, there's a little sand viper. Can you see it over there? And I'll just have to point it out before Seb goes to it because I'm terrible with my sandpipers. It's one... Is it a wood sandpiper? Now you're all probably going, no, Taylor, it's not a wood sandpiper. So I'm going to open the sandpiper section on my mobile device. Sandpiper. Sandpiper one, two, and three. No, man, this is supposed to be easy. It's got yellow legs. Is it a green? No, it's not a green shank. Let's go to the next page. I haven't seen these critters for such a long time. Is it a wood sandpiper? Does it have a white supercilium that goes beyond its eye? Can you see it, Seb? No, I also can't see it nicely. Who else has got yellow legs? Or is it just a common sandpiper? No, I don't know. I'm really hopeless. No, it is. It is. It is a wood sandpiper. I must... I need to honestly go with my gut a bit more. I do this all the time. I doubt myself. Here, you can see that. Woo! Hello! That was rude. This is the... This is the blacksmith lapwing I was giving a talking to earlier. And now you can see how territorial these birds are. Chasing that sandpiper away, just to go back, it was a wood sandpiper, you could see, because of that white, uh, not the white, the white eye stripe that goes right behind the eye. And they're not particularly big either, but not staying here for too long. I was going to say, very lucky to be walking around so close to that blacksmith lapwing. They don't tolerate anybody, except when the little three-banded plovers turn on them. That's also quite funny to watch. But always here, always a guaranteed sighting when you come to these dams to find either little three-banded plovers or, of course, the blacksmith lapwings. And uh, the Egyptian geese and the terrapins. have got to give uh, credit when it's due. The terrapins did a sterling job today, so well done to them. Um, now you can see how the wind is also picking up. <laughs> Paula, you've agreed with me today. You've said he's got some nerve. I Listen, that's why I sassed him. Remember... We can't be too horrible to this blacksmith lapwing because it is sassy Saturday today. So you have to allow some leeway. So get your sass on. Hashtag sassy Saturdays on Safari Live. It'll be great. Oh, who's just popped down there? Little five inch of sorts. Looks like it. I can't really see. It's so bright. We're kind of looking into the sun at the moment, which doesn't help. Are they blue? Nikki, did you say they were blue waxfuls? Do they look blue to you, Seb? 
little bit. Oh, anyways, on my monitor, they looked black. <laughs> to the sun, so I could not tell you what those little birds that landed. They were either going to be wax bills or little five inches. I've actually been seeing a lot of five inches flying around. Oh, there's the sandpiper, Seb, on the other side. It's flown to safety. Although, it better be careful because I did see another sandpiper, not another sandpiper, another blacksmith lapwing going around. I had an audience, this one now. It was being watched by all the terrapins. Seems to be a bit more of an efficient feeder, and I suppose that long bill definitely helps when you need to reach the water. Gremlins, now, great name, and I, listen, are you the cause of our technical difficulties all the time? Because if so, I need to pull you aside and have a word with you. I mean, you're teasing. <laughs> but you've asked if the, if the sandpipers only, no, if they ever eat fish. Well... I've only ever seen them feeding on insects because they live at the water's edge. It would not surprise me if they ate other things like tadpoles, frogs occasionally, maybe some crustaceans, freshwater crabs, um, and then, of course, small fish. And um, who knows, you get shrimp in here too. I suppose that falls in maybe the crustacean section. Oh, what was that? Looked like it caught something bigger than an insect there. And, and if it is going to start moving around in sort of that marshy area, then perhaps it is also going after things like frogs. So there's a number of different um, m sort of potential meals that a sandpiper could find. But the one thing we must remember is we, we talk about lions and leopards being opportunistic feeders as well. So they'll scavenge, they'll take what they can get. And birds are the same thing. They're not particularly fussy. They, they need to make sure that they eat as much as they can when they can because, again, they don't know when they're going to get their next meal. They can't just pop on down to the grocery store and fill their shopping trolley up and, you know, wheel it on out for a week like what we do or perhaps stop, a, stop at a takeaway place. Can't be doing any of that. Oh, what did it chase? Look, there we go. That was a good meal. I don't know what that was that it caught, but it looked like it came out of the water. Careful that terrapin might steal it from you. Now, seeing as though the terrapins are popping up every now and then and we watched one wave at us, I suppose we better chat about them. And Andrew, you had a question about how long do terrapins live for. I haven't got a clue, but I know that tortoises and ter uh, turtles can live for a very, very long time. So the leopard tortoise can live just shy of a hundred years. I would say that the terrapin could live quite a long time too. Maybe not quite as long. What, maybe between 30 and 50 years or so? I don't have a reptile book with me, so I can't actually have a look. But maybe you can help me, Andrew. Perhaps you can check me up. Maybe have a look at um, the various terrapin species and we can see what the average age is. I mean, what age does a what age does a turtle live to in the States? Obviously, we don't. This is the equivalent, a snapping turtle. I mean, they get monstrous. I've seen some huge pictures of um, of the terrapins. So you can hashtag Safari Live or tell us on the YouTube chat. Now, you saw how those terrapins were lurking on the edge as that sandpiper was moving about all stealth-like. And, Kathy, you've just asked... Would a terrapin go after small water birds? I would not put it past a terrapin. I really wouldn't. Imagine a young, inexperienced chicken. You've seen some of those big ones that, you know, lurk in the waters of Buffalo Dam. And if Brent's on his way there, perhaps he's going to find the Loch Ness Monster equivalent of a terrapin down that end. And um, let me show you how big they are. So I'm sure some of the bigger ones, yes, perhaps they will. Uh, I haven't seen it, but again, I don't write off anything anymore. I know how unpredictable nature can be, and it's pretty amazing with the things that they do go after and they do catch. Well, no elephants. I feel like we've waited enough uh, or spent enough time down at Treehouse Dam hoping that an elephant was going to pop on by. Not our luck. We'll swing past you a little bit later. Off we go to uh, Tristan, who's managed to beat off the gremlins, and I think he'll be close to arriving at Chitwa. Well, we are close to Chitwa, Taylor. We very very close indeed in fact we're on ledwood road just going to pop out onto cheetah cut line very shortly and we did have a brief view of a leopard tortoise but it went scurrying off into a thicket where we couldn't see it again so we decided not to worry it and not to disturb it in any way so hopefully that will be a good sign we've had one type of leopard now we need to get another couple types in the form of the actual cats 
themselves. So that's going to be the plan at least. I believe there was trucks for Tandy was actually seen this morning when we, after we closed down, um, going into Torchwood from Juma, but it'll be interesting to see if she comes back again. Maybe she has a kill and she went to go fish the cub. That'll be nice if that's the case. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. I think Brent's going to be on those tracks. So, Sharon, the Anderson Hukumuri story that was, Taylor was mentioning, basically what happened was the two of them came together. It was just a normal kind of situation with male leopards in that they often are patrolling and they vocalize and they hear each other and then they come together. And so basically they came together and they just walked side by side, growling, hissing, carrying on. There was no actual evidence of them properly fighting other than that. Anderson was seen the next day with a few cuts on him, but none of them looked very fresh in my opinion. I mean, I might be completely wrong, but none of them looked really fresh. It looked like there was a little bit of granulation of the tissue on the edges, which means that it's a little older. So you might, they might have come to blows at some point, but then the next morning they were seen going their separate ways and Anderson went further south and Hukumuri crossed actually into Juma. It was when we then tracked him all the way and then he kind of into Juma and then turned south back again down towards Hoffman's into an area that he spends quite a bit of time. So it doesn't seem like anything too major happened, but it's interesting because when Anderson fought with Tingana, it was, well not fought, but had a, the territorial kind of standoffs with Tingana, it was the exact same thing. The two would walk together like this, growling, salivating, um, lots and lots of um, audio, and, but they never actually came to blows. They never actually went after each other or hurt each other in any way. And so it's interesting that it seems as though Anderson, even for all his size, is far more comfortable to try and impose himself via his audio and his just general appearance than he is to actually engage unless i suppose hukumuri came at him i'm sure he would fight with him but in terms of a size difference anderson is definitely a bigger individual and therefore hukumuri would have a very tough time trying to probably well i think he, i don't even think he would be able to actually physically match up to anderson anderson's size but you never know sometimes you get these smaller male leopards that pack a serious punch and they you know hukumuri's traveled a long distance so who knows what's happened to him in his life how many times he's had to confront other males and maybe he's learned a thing or two and that's why anderson kind of kept his distance i don't know but a line would have now been drawn between the two of them that this is the fringes of your territories and that line will be ever changing as time goes forward but for now, it's going to be that's where they each will kind of move off and then go their separate ways. For a long time with Tingana, it was the Marikeng drainage, which is on Arethusa. Careful there, VM, don't get scratched. And the Marikeng is where they used to, one would walk on one side and the other one on the other side. And they would often scent mark and then the next day you'd see the other one on the other side of the bank scent marking and it was this kind of constant sort of line that was drawn between them and then eventually over time Tingana pushed more and more and more to the east and kind of left that area for Anderson and Anderson actually funny enough didn't push more west I don't think there was any females that were in estrus in these areas that actually could entice Anderson and there was more females to the south and to the to the west uh, sorry I meant he didn't push any further east but there's more females to the south and the west and so he pushed those directions rather than coming more towards our direction which is a bit of a shame it would be nice to have had anderson in this area let's try not to fall down too hard there we go we negotiated that okay now just wanted to come and check the little hole that is this termite mound we know that there's a warthog that lives here hyenas have used this before as well and so it's always good just to double check it and see it's also a nice little leopard spot as well but no one is home. So, well, Gina, the current leopards that we have on Juma at the moment is zero. No, I'm joking. We've been struggling the last two days to find any of our leopards because of with the rain that we've had. But theoretically, the leopards that we can see on Juma is Hukumuri, Tandi, and um, Cub. And we've got then Shadulu, um, Hosanna, Tamba. Um, that's it really on Juma. Then if we go towards Chitwa, Tingana and Kuchaba and Cub and possibly Quarantine, that's about it for that side at the moment. So obviously we're changing and they're in and out all the time. So it's difficult to say who's actually on the property at any one time, but I can tell you that it's been really tough for us in the last few days. We haven't found much in the way of any leopards. So I don't think there's many on Juma right this minute, but 
but they are those are the ones that kind of come in and out at the moment but there's some beautiful guinea fowl which are very relaxed I, it would be nice if they were squawking and squeaking in the top of a tree because that would undoubtedly mean that there maybe was a leopard nearby but they look very relaxed and they'll be s full of the joys of life after the rains they'll be going into the grasses that are seeding and feeding off all of those nutritious grasses that they've got i'm pretty sure that's not going to be the last guinea fowl we're going to see today they're absolutely everywhere on chitra and so while we head that way let's send you across to brent leo smith and see what updates he has i know he's been on the bifflesuk boundary and there was actually a young little leopard cub that was seen on bifflesuk boundary this morning that was very skittish a little bit older than tundi's cub and so i wonder if brent's found any sign for that little one What a mystery. I wonder which little leopard that is. Um, we're just going very slowly now. We've moved off the Bufferswick boundary. We're doing the Torchwood uh, boundary with Juma now. And uh, Aubrey's gone to follow the last tracks. Uh, what he thinks happens is she stashed the cub somewhere in Torchwood. And she's come hunting on Juma after the rain this morning. And uh, we, what we're hoping is that she's made a kill. Oh. Hang on. Wild dogs. Apparently, um, a visitor coming in to visit someone in Buffalo's Hook saw wild dogs very close to the gate. Uh, we were close there now. We didn't see any tracks. Uh, it sounds like Taxon's going to go check, so I will keep my ears open. That would be exciting. I know Tristan, how much Tristan loves the leopards, but I would drop a cat for a dog any day of the week. And that also includes in pets. Uh, I'm not a big cat pet person, uh, but I do love my dogs. It's always amazing though that cats seem to know that you don't like them, so they come all rub themselves on your legs. Now, chatting of cats, I'm sure some of you at home have heard your your pet cat have a good snore. Now, Avon was asking, do you, have I ever heard any of the big cats snore? Yes, I've heard lion snore, I've heard leopard snore. We heard cheetah snore, I think we have heard cheetah snore in the Mara as well. Yes, yeah, so they do snore, it's, un, it's unusual, uncommon, it's normally when they're lying at a funny angle. Did we spot over there? Uh, I saw a batelier, but I thought it was going down, but it's not. It's just, it's just flying. So if you see a batelier heading down towards the ground, it's normally a good sign that there is some meat about. But when it's cruising like that, it's just looking for some meat. Oh dear. Okay, now I think for the to answer the next question, I'm going to have to draw a map in the sand um, to explain how far Mala Mala is from Juma. Actually, no, I don't. Huh. I think I even have a map. I do have a map. Let me find some shade so Dave doesn't have to deal with Blair. Oh, that map doesn't really work, does it? <laughs> it's too small. Uh, it, it's only Juma. That doesn't work. Oh dear. Um, let me try to think now. So, Mala Mala is about the same width as Juma from there down. <laughs> so, it's that much. But I was joking. So, um, that's about four. So, it depends. Mala Mala is a massive area. Um, Mala Mala is 14,500 hectares. So,. I don't know whether the, the Birmingham's are north of the Sand River or south of the Sand River, uh, but the closest boundary as the crow flies from us to Mala Mala is about three kilometers, uh, but it could be as far as 15 kilometers, just depends where in Mala Mala. The one thing about the rain, the flies are out. 
and someone is definitely going to be swatting at flies because she is with animals that the flies like to buzz around constantly. Hopefully not, because I've said many colourful words to the flies today already and clapped my hands at them, so hopefully that'll be enough to warn them. But I totally get what Brent is saying, is that unfortunately every time the buffalo come through, my goodness, do thousands and thousands of flies follow in suit. Hmm. Please not today. This is the same herd that we saw this morning, uh, the same group of buffalo that the Avoca male, avoca, sorry, not avoca, avoca males. Nikki, am I saying it correctly? <laughs> I'm just checking. I just want to make sure that I'm pronouncing it correctly. Brent doesn't like it when we say avoca. He says we must say avoca. I feel like if I say avoca, I also need to uh, drink my tea and my pinky sticking out. Anyways, I have a South African accent, so I do apologize if I say avoca every now and then. Um, and so what I was going to say with that, it's the same group of buffalo that they snatched some buffalo up. Now, uh, I was chatting to a friend of mine, Gary, who was, uh, on, he's on safari at the moment. And he said to me that when he went into the lion sighting a little bit earlier, they actually found some baby hooves, so like some really small ones. So it's quite interesting because there's no carcass that they're feeding on. They obviously disappeared into the thicket and into an area where we didn't have any signal. They must have caught a relatively newborn calf and then also a sub-adult calf. Because, I mean, we saw that one as he was walking away, yeah, he had a bulging belly, but I mean, it it wasn't the size that we normally see uh, their bellies to be. Oh, Seb, there's, there's some coming here. We might have one cross the road right in front of us. Hello, girl. We're just waiting for her. Hello, big girly. So, quite cool to see, in fact. Quite interesting. So they had two buffalo snacks. Hi. walking right past us. She looks like she could be bearing a calf. She's got a big belly. And they seem to be dropping at the moment. Hey, Oxpecker just coming in for a landing. She's very relaxed too. Not flustered by us. I think she's a bit on the warm side at the moment. She seems to be trying to cool herself down. She's just stopped in a patch of shade. Where are you going to go and drink tonight? This is what we want to try and figure out, everyone. Shall we play a guessing game? Let's do that. Where do we think this herd of buffalo is going to go and drink? Are they going to go to Treehouse Dam? I'll give you some dams that are in the area. Are they going to go to Vuyatela Dam, where the dam cam is? Are they going to stretch all the way to Twin Dams? Or perhaps just pop past Pangolin Track and visit Chele Pan? What do you think? Oh, she's browsing. Here we go. Hashtag Safari Live. Let's have some guesses coming through. Here's something that we normally only see buffalo doing in the winter months, and that is browsing on that tree. That's quite cool to see, in fact. 95% of a buffalo's diet is, in fact, grass. Normally when the times are tough, or I suppose if they're feeling a little bit on the ill side too, you can watch them browse, which is quite cool. Ah... And our little friend Aiden, who's only six years old. Aiden, when are you turning seven? When can I go, my little friend Aiden, who's seven? I'm excited for that. Let me know when your birthday is. Are you wondering what these buffalo actually ate? Well, they eat a bit of everything, mainly grass, like I said. And then they do love to eat round leaf teak, but that one looked like it was eating a russet bush willow, a small one. Hello. All the girls. All the girls have come for a tea party today. This is a young cow here on the right. What are you looking at? Why do you look so nervous? Come stand by us. Just don't bring your flies. You hear that noise she made? What's wrong? You're a bit distressed. I'm sorry. Are you having a bad day? Would you like to talk about it? Yes? Having conversations with Buffalo, as you can see. I thought she'd said something to me. Sorry, Nikki. I was too busy being silly. What does the... Uh, can I please have all that information again? Ah... Uh. Now, as we stare at the buffalo's horns, Carla has asked if they are hollow. They are not hollow, in fact. There's actually a bony protrusion that goes right the way through them. You obviously can't see in the darkness that you're seeing on those horns is a keratin sheath. Hey, big girl, they're all listening to us. Am I giving the correct information, buffalo? Is that true? Or am I fabricating? Am I telling stories again? Raise your head if you say that's true. 
Well done. <laughs> so clever. <laughs> so there you go. You can't really see, but there's a bo that's a bony protrusion there. It's just covered with hair and skin at the moment. And that's the base of the skull. And with the males, they get that massive boss. And the girls lack that completely. You just got a horn up at the bottom, didn't you? Got told to keep on moving. She keeps looking over her shoulder. Who are you missing? You have somebody else that you're waiting for? I wish I could talk to them. Goodness, can you imagine the conversations I'd have with these wonderful animals? Oh, she's still watching us. Snorting, can you hear that? <laughs> she's unsure about us. Okay, bye, Buffalo, fine then. Huh? And now they've now moved off. We. Do we smell like lions? Oh, ma actually, Seb, remember I said I think we may have driven through lion dung this morning? That could actually be it. Maybe that's why they were so interested in the vehicles, because we don't sound like lions. There's no lions on this car. They don't obviously don't associate us with lions. But perhaps you're quite right. Maybe we smell like them. And that's why they were so, sh well, confused. Uh, although I've said to you, you usually have quite nice sightings of buffalo herds in the Sabi sand, even in Kruger. They don't mind the vehicles so much, and they carry on, they move around, they sort of interact with you a little bit. Not like the animals of the Mara that put on blinkers and just walk past you like this. Like, well, if you don't make eye contact, they won't take a picture. That's kind of what it feels like sometimes. We will catch up with them, though. Remember, we're going to have a competition to see who can guess where these buffalo are going to go and drink. They are slowly moving in a southerly direction maybe that will help you guess we were on rebecca's road shall we pull up the map so you can have a what we'll oh goodness almost lost that map to the back i shall stop in the shade very quickly and we'll just show you the map and you can have a look okay i'll try and point out to you i did i cut my nails today so we were we came from philemon's cut line and then we went on to Rebecca's. So we were halfway on Rebecca's. That's where we were. Now, those animals were going south, so they're going in this direction. So I said to you, we've got some dams to choose from. We had Chele Pan. We had Treehouse Dam. Sorry, Seb, and then we'll go to Twin Dams. And then I'll just show you very quickly where Voyatella Dam is. It's just up a little way in the complete opposite direction. I have to go north to get there. So it'll be quite nice to see. I mean, we could all be wrong. Maybe they turn... <laughs> Nikki wants to know what's that. Nikki's directing today. It was a bird. I think I was trying to talk about the Wahlberg's eagles flying, and then it looked more like a bat than anyways. Anyways, well, that's a pathetic drawing. What I am going to do, though, is hide my head in shame and also try and find something that I can remove that terribly drawn bird on and send you across to Brent. Welcome back. Unfortunately, no sign of Tandy coming back onto a Juma, so she's still on Torchwood. I will keep an ear out uh, to see if Aubrey's got any updates for us a little later. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to slowly move towards uh, Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Uh, to see what's happening around there and uh, maybe there'll be some eddies who are headed for a swim in the hot weather now strangely enough I think we're gonna struggle for elephants in the next little while after the rain I think they might do a bit of a disappearing act now when people go on safari people are most interested in seeing Africa's big five now child of the universe is asking how many do we expect to see on this safari well a child of the universe we could see all five or we could see none that's the thing about being on a live safari uh, but I expect we will see at oh we've already seen one with Taylor Buffalo uh, I expect we might find some elephant so two and I'm hoping Tristan, oh, I'm, I'm expecting at least three on this drive. So buffalo, elephant, and lion. Hopefully Tristan can make it four with the leopard. Uh, but unfortunately, we, we don't show rhinos. And uh, that is due to the current poaching situation in South Africa. So we might see rhinos, but unfortunately, we can't show them to you 
uh, in South Africa. However, when the Mara camp opens up again, uh, we can show you rhinos in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Now, the Big Five of Africa originally gets its name from the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. And uh, so that's where the, the Big Five terminology originally comes from. What, 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 what little tracks are those? Warthogs. There you go. Warthog tracks. You can see they're very rounded and very wide. So little piggies have been walking down the road. And uh, we've had them wallowing in, in the little water hole we just drove past, but they weren't there today. Now, I don't know what the temperature is now. I'm guessing it's probably around 31, 32 degrees Celsius, which is around... 80 something Fahrenheit maybe can't remember uh, but at 88 there we go thank you Nicola Nicola's in my ear and uh, so we're coming towards the end of summer so it actually should start cooling off now our hottest our hottest time of the year Andrew uh, who was asking about how hot it can get uh, is normally January uh, maybe we can also be hot but uh, when it's really hot it, it is not uncommon for this part of the world uh, to hit uh, 41 to 45 degrees Celsius so over a hundred Fahrenheit actually it was a couple of years ago where I was at this Buffalo Sook Dam where we're heading to right now and we were filming elephants and it got so hot the camera just turned off the camera just went overheat overheat warning warning so we actually couldn't even broadcast that it got so hot that the cameras decided to turn off those were the old UX's though the, 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 the old bigger cameras these little cameras seem to handle the harsher conditions a bit better but if it, if it does if they do sit in the Sun like any 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 electronic uh, if they get too hot they switch themselves off so as not to damage themselves oh we got some more war truck tracks this time heading in the opposite direction so maybe there might be some swine around the corner Uh, we're about 100 meters from the water hole. Hello, Tesla, who is, oh, a very big seven years old. And Tesla, you are very, very observant. Tesla wants to know, where have all the zebra and impala gone? Well, Tesla, the Impala are here. They are somewhere here. We, we should find them. I'm sure we will see them at some point on this afternoon's drive. But uh, the Zebra have gone to the north of us. And they've gone there because it's there's very good grass for them there. And at this time of the year, the Zebra go into that area and they eat all the good food that's there. And then as it gets drier, the Zebra will actually move back. Uh, back to here, so we should start seeing nice groups. Uh, what's what are we now? My uh, end of April uh, into May is when the zebra come back. It doesn't mean we might not see one or two zebra, uh, but those the bigger groups of zebra are only going to come back normally around then. And we have arrived at the spot where my turned off because it was so hot two years ago, but unfortunately, there are no elephants two years down the road but there are a few hippopotamus in the water here we go let's get a little bit closer to those hippos and while we are meandering towards those hippos uh, I said a little bit earlier that elephants might be a bit more difficult to find and Patrick was wondering why? Well, I think what happens is that depending on where the rain has been and whatnot, uh, they're like the zebras, the elephants have, uh, well, not as 
defined, but they have local movements. So they might be moving down towards the Sand River, or they might be moving towards the Gabros, um, just to feed. So I think we, we had it quite lucky. We had a lot of elephants around for quite a while. I just think their natural cycle, they've moved into a different area. I hope I'm wrong. But there will still be elephants. I just don't think we're going to be seeing as many elephants as we have been seeing in the last week or so. Hello, Hippopotamus. He's looking at you, Dave. Now, there were two hippos, yeah, probably both young bulls. Oh, shy hippos. Now, why I say they're young bulls, you can see there's not a lot of hippos, there's not a lot of ladies around. And quite often what will happen is the big dominant male hippo will push these young boys out and they'll live where there aren't any girls to be had for a little while till they get big enough and strong enough to go challenge. Okay, well, we are sitting at a waterhole with hippos. Tristan has found some other form of creature that lives in the water all the way on Chitwa. Well, we have found something. I don't know where it's disappeared to. I'm trying to find it now for you. But it's a little baby crocodile that was here behind the dam wall. In fact, there was two of them that I saw. There it is. You see it's just going in the water there? So it's just slowly going away from us. But this is where our baby crocs have gone. So they're very clever. They've gone from the big dam where there's going to be lots of danger for these little guys and where they're going to have a problem trying to stay safe from big birds and all kinds of other things and they've come behind the dam wall now where it's a lot safer for them and they've come into these thick reeded areas where they can then sit and try and stay as safe as is possible so very good place for a crocodile to go and you can see it camouflages incredibly well if it just sits still like that it's going to be very difficult to see now there is two of them now Jigger hold Jigger doesn't want to hold. There we go. Jigger's now holding. But there is two of them. One is on the, the far side, on the main sort of part of the pond, and behind that fallen over tree. We saw it swimming there. You can actually see some ripples. That's where it was, was in that area. And so maybe that's the little, another little one swimming about. And it sounds like a few birds that are alarm calling too. I wonder... If maybe Hosanna is not lurking somewhere here, it would be nice if he was. This is an area where I think he might have come after his bushbuck meal. He might have come out of Chitwa camp and come and lay in the nice cool shade that is this back end area. But you can hear a few birds alarm calling. Vefi, it is a baby croc party in the in the kiddies pool. They've been given free reign of the kiddies pool and they are certainly using it to their advantage. And it'll be a great place for them because lots of food that they can get here, lots of croc uh, little frogs, um, insects that they can grab. But the only problem is they're going to have to be very careful because a crocodile of this size, somebody like Hosanna won't second guess taking a crocodile of this size. They'll run in and grab it. So they will have to be a bit careful and keep their eye out. Otherwise, they will become a tasty snack for a spotted cat. So I've seen leopards going after young crocodiles like this a few times and so it needs to be a little careful by being in the kiddies pool. At least there's lots of vegetation where they can hide and get away if there is a leopard lurking. But how's that beautiful color eye that they've got? Crocodiles have the most amazing eyes. Kind of lots and lots of very cool colors in there. Greens and yellows. Hey little one, where are you going? What's it doing? Look, it's almost like it's rolling around. So Taylor McCurdy wants me to try and wrangle a crocodile. Now, Taylor, I have a firm belief when it comes to these things that they should not be played with. So crocodiles, monitor lizards, frogs to a degree, um, snakes, they, I don't go and pick up impalas and I don't pick up leopards and so I don't pick up any of the others. It just puts that animal in unnecessary stress and that's why I don't like doing it. So I'm not going to be wrangling any crocodiles today but the birds are going crazy so I want to just quickly check what is here. You never know, maybe there's something interesting that's in this area. We'll come back to our little crocs because I wonder what they're doing by kind of filtering, they're almost like shaking in the mud there. I wonder if they're trying to sort of disturb some frogs to get to them. Now this is where the birds are making a lot of noise. Maybe it's a snake. It's good weather for a snake after that rain that we've had. This is actually a great place for a python, funny enough. 
There's a hornbill. Let's just stop and see. When there is a snake and birds are around, they'll mob the snake and they'll go and they'll flutter their wings near it and they'll try and make a noise, but there's definitely a disturbance somewhere up ahead of us here. So I'm just trying to see where the majority of the birds are. They're in where the hornbill, just to the left of the hornbill, and kind of looking down. Hold on, let me get my binoculars out here and have a little look around. Sometimes a pair of binoculars is a great tool when searching for things like snakes because they allow you to kind of just see past vegetation a little bit and you can get that little sheen of the scales sometimes a little closer and you can pick them up. But I don't see anything. Maybe what we need to do is just try and go around and onto the top side there. There's a nice little kind of platform up there that we can get into. The only problem is I don't know how good this crossing is going to be. I think I'd probably prefer to go around the other side to check it. This crossing has become a little bit dodgy and so let's rather do that. And while we do that, let's send you across to Taylor McCurdy and see what her plans are from the buffalo and whether or not she's going to have any luck trying to look for those wild dogs. Tristan, you won't believe it. We we're actually just talking about wild dogs, funny enough. Um, I said, should we annoy everybody and find wild dogs today? I know Brent will be a little bit sad. I think if I found wild dogs today, I'd look at them for five minutes and then maybe call him in. Just because I know it's been such a long time since he's seen an African painted wolf. And they are indeed his favorite animal in the whole wide world. So, you know, sometimes I'm nice. But I haven't found them, so we can't be saying things like this just yet. Anyways, we're gonna, we'll scratch around and hopefully between the two of us we'll be able to find some. I'm still on my mission for elephants. I don't know what I've done to the elephants to deserve this kind of behavior from them. But um, I thought I was always quite nice to them and spoke to them politely and, you know, greeted them. Oh well. We're going to look for them, we'll check. We have just, what road are we even on? Balanites Road? I think this is Balanites Road. We're heading towards Impala Plains now, having a scratch around uh, just to see if there's anything here. Remember, there's so many mud wallows within this area that there could be in elephants anywhere. They don't necessarily actually have to go to the dams, it could be at the mud wallows. So that is the plan from here. And every time I come here, there's never any animals, and I don't understand why. I mean, it's perfect. Sometimes there's three wildebeest here, but it's like a nice open plain, lots of grass around us. So you can see it's, in my opinion, it's perfect grazing. Oh, well, perhaps the grass is not as tasty as it is on the other side. Maybe that's the case. So we'll head down towards the western boundary, have a little check there. Um, check a couple more pans, maybe even check Sydney's Dam. I wonder if Sydney's Dam actually has water in it now. We might try and have a look if the gremlins don't fight us off. That seems to be their territory down that end. And then I don't know. And if any of you do see any elephants on uh, the dam cam, please let me know. I will race there. I will Ferrari Safari to the elephants, I promise. So you know how to get hold of us. Apparently there's only an Egyptian goose. At the dam, we probably won't be Ferrari sparring to the Egyptian goose, however. Because Tristan's at Chitwa, you are going to be seeing many. Oh, bye Dacre. There was a Dacre very far away, bouncing in the road in front of us. And all for Dwayne. Maybe we can look at its feet prints that it left in the ground. And see. wasn't a bad guess of mine. Juma Junkie, I'm going to jump out here very quickly. Thank you so much for getting back to me about uh, the terrapins and their lifespan. You've said that they live between 30 and 45 years. Fantastic. I think I said they live somewhere around there. So that was quite cool. Good guess. These are freshly placed Dacre hooves. No Dacre though. Yeah, you can see. So remember I just said to you it was hopping on the road. It actually, it leaped quite a massive distance. I'm going to show you. Check this out. So yeah, obviously it was running. I can see footprints down the road. Now, as we know, a lot of the times when antelope get into a bit of a sprint, they can bounce really quite high. So here's a set of four, as you can see. And then look how, how high and far it's leaped. And there's the other ones over there. I mean, that's probably a meter and a half or so. Maybe, yeah, about a meter and a half. 
That's pretty cool. That's a big jump. The one back here is even further. <laughs> this is about two meters behind us, in fact. Crazy. So, quite easy to see how a Dacre can, in fact, outrun a pack of wild dogs quite easily. I'm going to get in the car because I can hear a vehicle coming around. Um, and that's what we saw the other day, which was pretty spectacular, was with Craig. And he'd never seen, he actually couldn't believe his eyes, how high that Dacre was jumping. Clean. It could have jumped clean over the car if it needed to. It also could have jumped straight over that fence that the Inyalas jumped over. They jumped into Vuyatela Lodge to get away from the dogs. I don't, I don't actually know how far a Dacre could leap in sort of lengths. I mean, we look at Impala and they can do about 10 meters, 30 foot. I'm going to say a Dacre at full tilt, probably jumping five to six meters in length quite easily and probably about two meters up, bouncing. Pretty easy. That, that's amazing. Now we'll keep scratching here. Oh, a very clever question from Sam Yu, who is another one of our younger viewers, only nine years old. Hello. You asked if uh, domestic dogs ever come into the property. They do indeed. They actually come in here more often than we see. And it's a big problem, Sam Yu. So the communities and cities and towns are not too far away from us. Yes, we have an electric fence around here and there's nothing all the way till the border of Mozambique and then you get into, obviously into the Kruger National Park so there's no fences but there is a fence around the Sabi Sand then going to the Manuleti and the Timbavati it's or Thorny Bush and Timbavati so yeah they are able uh, to come through now it's very sad and I have to be honest with you here one of the biggest problems in in the Sabi Sand and, and just the greater Kruger in, in general is that the, those dogs bring in some nasty diseases like rabies and canine distemper it's not very nice and that can kill an entire pack of wild dogs and we don't want to see that because wild dogs are under threat they're endangered too and those diseases can be passed on to lots of different animals out here so what they do have to do if they do find those dogs in here most of the time they probably don't even have a home those dogs they're just strays they'll have to shoot them they have to put them down and we have to do that it's one of the conservation things that well I'm lucky that I don't have to do it because I don't know if I could do it I know how important it is but I love dogs I think if I didn't have a choice and I'd, I'd have to but it's one of the things that happens Archer and it's very very sad and they they end up putting down almost a hundred dogs every year so very very sad like I said though but it has to be done it's the same thing with the the domestic cat populations that have started interbreeding with African wild cats I was talking about this the other day down in the Eastern Cape of South Africa so down on the southeast coast it's a huge problem 90% of the African wild cats you find probably don't have a clean gene pool anymore they've been polluted by the feral cats that were all brought in by the settlers to control the rodent populations with all the farming that they were doing and now they also have to put down those cats when they find them in the wilderness areas in hope that they can try and restore the uh, the bloodlines of the African wild cats. It's very sad, but again, it's us, it's humans. We've done this, we've made this mess, and now we have to try and clean it up. And cleaning up a mess is sometimes you've got to do it, you know, not always the greatest way, I'm afraid. So it is sad, and it, it, it trust me, I brings it makes me want to cry when I hear that they've been putting dogs down, but. It's got to be done. <laughs> now, Kobe, who's 15 years old, and I know you're quite keen on learning all the ins and outs about wildlife, you've asked, do I think the white rhino population will go extinct since Sudan, the northern white rhino, passed away? Uh, uh, yes, of course, but I don't think it's directly because of him. It's the game. Not me. I'm, I'm not doing the poaching. But people, humans, we are the biggest problem. We really are. And it's so sad that in this day and age, we're still watching animals go extinct right in front of our eyes. I think if I ever have children one day, Kobe, I don't think that they'll see white rhinos, to be honest. Unless it was maybe in a zoo. I don't think we're going, yeah, I 
don't think that there's going to be a lot of animals that I don't think my children, if I do have children one day, will will be able to see. Sadly, I'll have to show them pictures of me with a rhino taking a selfie, or perhaps when I've done some conservation work. So very, very sad, isn't it? It's not nice. Hello, but there's not just rhino. There's lots of animals: Ethiopian wolves, pandas, tigers. So many different animals out there. Pangolin. That's the most trafficked mammal in the world. But here's William, the wildebeest. I don't know if his name is William, but we do love alliteration, don't we? He doesn't really have a name. Not having anything to do with it, probably upset with the fact that Sudan, the northern white rhino, passed away. I'd also be stomping off of my head, hung low, off into the distance. And he is awaiting a breeding herd, a group of females to come and pass and keep him company. Otherwise, he's got a couple of impala. We can't see them at the moment, but there were some impala in between the guari trees. And, um, well, yes, very sad. Now I'm a little bit depressed after that conversation. Anyways, I'm going to drive around and try and find something to make me all happy again. Talking about somebody that's probably going to make you smile is Brent. Well, hello, hello, welcome back. And the missing impala have been found. And quite a nice big herd of them as well. All looking lovely and fresh and clean after the rain this morning. It's hard to believe that we were cold and miserable and completely drenched a few hours ago. And now it is warm and sunny and hot impala in the shade nice big herd of impala around here now there's a couple of these big herds uh, on Juma there's one here around sandy patch that moves through to impala plains and the other big herd that's normally around quarantine Now, the impalas will breed every year, and, oh, it's over here, Dev. There's the little one having a drink. Oh, you're not going to be able to drink from Mom for too much longer. Uh, Sheila was wondering, do the animals have a biological clock like humans do? Now, uh, Sheila, I'm not sure what you mean. And... Uh, well, yes, so as soon as they come into estrus, they will mate almost immediately. Uh, it's a lot less complicated than human life. And uh, then they get to a stage where they're unable to mate, and, and, and then they no longer produce babies. But they normally get eaten before then. And so I'd say they have a biological instinct to procreate, to produce offspring. The little boys, his little horns. So we've done quite a, a fair swathe of Juma checking for any signs of leopards. Um, I just got a call from Tristan on the radio about a report of possible leopard tracks crossing into Juma. I'm just going to check where Taylor is to see if she's closer than us. Taylor, Taylor. You guys better watch out if the wild dogs come. Now this is a wild dog's, well, wouldn't, wouldn't they have the favorite food? I don't think they have a favorite food. Everything is their favorite food. Whatever they can catch is their favorite food. Uh, Off it goes, quick little impalas. Vroom! They disappeared there, and there's a wildebeest. Where are you off to, Gnu? Now, African wild dogs are one of the most endangered animals in the world, but we'll chat about them 
in a moment because we've got some lovely behavior by this big dominant male of wildebeest. And what he's doing is he's actually scent marking. He's not having a scratch. He's got glands on his face. And he'll rub them in on prominent spots uh, within his territory and, uh, and to make sure all other wildebeest males that might come wandering through thinking that this beautiful, perfect, ideal, short-grassed wildebeest territory is free, they might meet some competition from this gentleman. Now the wildebeest rut should be starting soon. So as it starts drying um, to the north of us, quite a lot of the wildebeest that will move out of those Gabbro plains in the southern Manuleti and uh, start heading down towards here. And hopefully we'll be lucky enough to see the rut again this year. It is fascinating to watch. Lots of commotion and ongoings uh, while the males try to convince the females that they are the business. Carol <laughs> says she always looks around to see if there's a predator lurking when we show these animals. Well, you'll probably find in Kenya that's not a bad idea at all. But uh, out here, uh, wildebeest probably are preyed on less so uh, by the different animals than they are in Kenya. Also, the fact that we don't have those massive herds of them. Well, he's found a nice shady spot. I think he might even have a, a little afternoon nap there. And... Uh, Looks like he might lie down. Are you going to lie down there? He's thinking about it. He might defecate on his dung midden first, so that's another way he marks territory. It looks like he's going to disappear off following the impala. And uh, speaking of other funny looking antelope, unique was asking are there any hartebeest in South Africa. Indeed they are, but there are no hartebeest in the Sabi Sands. So the red hartebeest occurs in the more arid areas to the north and west of us and there is a small remnant population of sesabi which is basically or is very closely related. Atopi and sesabi are considered to be subspecies um, of each other uh, to the north of us. But no hartebeest in this particular area. Now, while we're meandering on, uh, we're chatting about wild dogs, and that's my favorite animal, and really hoping they make an appearance this afternoon. And uh, we have a very, very interesting question from Scott, uh, who was asking, how do they deal, you deal with distemper amongst the wild dog populations here? So, it's, uh, the Endangered Wildlife Trust has a, an ongoing project with the dogs. Uh, if they, they ever have to dart, move, or or do anything to the dogs, they're immediately given uh, vaccina vaccinations against distemper. And uh, the new vaccination is, is, is a lot easier. You don't have to inject it. It's a little pill that go, they put in a piece of meat and you can even go up to dogs if they are out here and throw the meat there and they'll actually ingest the pill. So for those of you who don't know what distemper is, uh, canine distemper is basically canine dysentery almost. So it's, uh, it causes the animals to have a very, very runny stomach and dehydrate and die, unfortunately. Um, so what happens is that uh, a lot of domestic dogs can be carriers and in areas where wild dogs come into contact with domestic dogs around the peripheries of the parks, distemper can be a very big problem. The other big problem from a disease point of view with uh, wild dogs is rabies and most of the rabies is also got from domestic dogs and uh, we've, we've had, it was about two years ago, we had a very bad rabies outbreak in the low felt in, the, in general. Now, so there's very interesting stuff, a, a rabid animal uh, can be identified quite easily in late stages of rabies but it's very difficult to identify in the early stages of rabies. So uh, uh, um, I suppose that the, the foaming at the mouth uh, the com acting crazy completely so domestic animals such as dogs and cows and sheep and goats and whatnot start behaving like wild animals become timid they're scared of people they're scared of uh, or, or, or mostly of people uh, in both cases they, they show signs of hydrophobia they become scared of water um, and 
wild animals that normally have a healthy respect uh, from people uh, become tame so they start walking right up to your car and stuff like that so uh, that's one of the one of the two of the actually well for domestic and wild uh, to see the different um, different way the wild and domestic animals react to to the rabies virus well well done Francis Francis gives her her, her dog the distemper pill very good on you Francis you're looking after wolves and wild dogs and coyotes and jackals or well, depending on where you are in the world of course uh, so one of the other things uh, with so the hydrophobia is quite a big one that they've become completely scared of water now one of the early signs of rabies in in domestic animals and in wild animals but it's harder to trace in wild animals um, is that the brain starts in, enlarging and uh, they lack the ability to go home or find home so if you find a domestic dog for example here on the reserve we'll immediately call the uh, the, the sabi sands um, and we'll destroy that animal we'll shoot it on site so the further from the boundary you find a domestic dog that i think i remember the paper it's every every two or three kilometers further from uh, the boundary where there are people with dogs that you find a domestic dog uh, the chances of that animal being rabid increases by 10 percent so confusion and unable to find a home base is, is sort of the first signs of, of rabies and domestic dogs and I, a lot of people sometimes can be quite upset but if we find any domestic dog in the reserve we destroy it or domestic cat for that matter we will report it and and shoot it immediately um for from, from a rabies distemper point of view domestic cats can also carry a whole bunch of horrible diseases and one of the the bigger problems with um with domestic cats in an area like this and in the greater Kruger uh, is the fact that they dilute African wildcat genetics they cro they can crossbreed and so there are very few places even uh, I would say probably most of the wildcats in the in the, in the Sabi sands are not true African wildcats anymore I would say that their genetics have been diluted with uh, domestic cats and so that's what's very very important that we destroy those animals destroy those animals when they come into wild areas. Mrs. Lapwing would like to know, are wild dogs endangered because of disease, because of humans? Well, both. Uh, they were persecuted quite heavily uh, during the 1800s and early 1900s. They were shot on sight. They were considered vermin. Uh, so were lions, so were leopards, so were hyena. So uh, the first mandate of the Kruger Park, they used to shoot all predators on sight to protect the impala and the zebra. So uh, conservation changes, uh, but yes. Yeah, so uh, one of the things about wild dogs, and and, and another reason why they're they're quite endangered, uh, as opposed and their their populations didn't recover as quickly as things like lions and leopards and hyenas. Oh, hyenas are a bit of a different story. We're not going to go just just stick with lions and leopards. Is is the fact that they firstly need massive home ranges. A single pack of wild dogs in this area need about six, uh, between 60 to 80,000 hectares, which is close to 200,000 acres for a single pack. And the problem is when they do get rabies or distemper, they are such a highly social animal where the greeting ceremonies is touching and biting lips and stuff that those diseases, which are both transmitted in saliva, uh, are immediately uh, spread through a whole population, a whole pack, a whole family group very quickly. So you can wipe out a group of 30 dogs within a week with one of those diseases where there's um, the lions and, and, and whatnot are not as as social. So it is, it is a, it's an interesting one. And um, what have you spotted, Dave? A monitor lizard. A monitor lizard, Dave. Well spotted, Dev. I thought you saw a leopard, Dev. I was about to congratulate you. There he is. It's a little rock monitor. It's a little one. Hello, little baby rock monitor. So we have two species of monitor lizards here in the Sabi Sands. We have the water monitor that lives around the water holes. And then this is the rock monitor. So he doesn't like water nearly as much. He likes trees. And uh, I think he's probably aiming to climb up that marula tree there. It looks like there's a nice hole for him there. And uh, they're quite ferocious predators, both the monitor species. The rock monitors actually specialize in eating things like, well, baby squirrels, more this size baby squirrels, baby bush babies, baby birds. 
baby birds, baby eggs, and you can oh, and birds' eggs. You can see that tongue coming out, and what he's doing is actually testing the air, and uh, that that is uses his taste almost as smell. Now I'll tell you a funny story about a rock monitor. So uh, a lot of you will know that Jamie and I own a house in in Hoodsprate, not too far away, on a wildlife estate. And at the moment, while we've been travelling so much in Kenya and all over the place, uh, we've been we've had tenants in the house, and uh, they're very nice. Oh, he's coming towards us. Dave is your friend. Now, I actually have one, had one of these stuck inside my car once before, but that's a completely different story. Let me finish the first one. So we had tenants who work for a, a, a company that do work on the Air Force Base in Hoodsprate. And uh, so they've been actually wonderful tenants, no complaints, and they've looked after the house very well. But we've had one complaint um, via our estate agent, which was absolutely hilarious because we were in Kenya. Uh, Jamie got this email and she said, come look at this. Uh, our tenants would like to know if we know that there's a crocodile in our thatch. <laughs> so it was quite funny. It wasn't a crocodile. It was a very big monitor lizard, probably about uh, nearly two meters in length. Now, during the winter months, they they can be quite a pain in thatch houses because it's nice and warm up in the roof, so they climb in there. They also go into the the thatched house roofs to hunt bush babies that also like to live in the thatch and squirrels. Now, you probably find this guy's out on the hunt, and normally at this time of the day, because of the cold weather, so he's been recharged by the sun. He's being very, very, very nice, and you can see that tongue. Isn't that incredible? Oh, it's going to be so long, it's going to be out of frame, Dave. And if you want the tongue, we need to keep lower. See how long it goes. Yup, there we go. Look at that. So, what he's doing is using his tongue to taste the air, looking for... Looking for different things. He's coming right towards us. Don't you dare come try to climb into my bonnet because it's warm, my friend. You and I will have words. Yes, that's better. You go that way. No, not towards me. Now, you can see that the tongue is forked as it comes in and out of the mouth. And see how it hits the ground. So it, it could be on the track of a squirrel, and that's why it's coming towards us. So it's tracking by taste. Mister, don't you come under my car, because don't you climb under my car. Sorry, I just don't, I've had problems with them coming into the, into the engine before, and, and that little one like that will take me a good booming 40 minutes to try to get out. Sorry, little chap. Let me move. If you want to walk this way and follow the, the squirrel. Squirrel. Oh, he went down a hole. Oh, you might even have a hole right there. Let's well, remember to keep a, an eye on this spot, because there's quite a few of his tracks coming in and out from that base of the tree. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to turn down my... There we go. Game drive radio for a second. It's very loud. Okay, so we've done a, a fair swathe of Juma, and unfortunately we haven't had many luck with predator tracks. Uh, and no one has gone to check on those evoker males, so I'm going to go see if we've got signal where they're hiding. Um, and hopefully, a little bit later, they might get up and get moving and maybe even give us a late evening roar. Okay. Well, I can hear my good friend Tristan waffling about on the game drive radio. So I'm just going to wait for him to finish talking on the radio. Which he has done by the sound of things. So he's finished talking on the game drive radio. So let's go see what Tristan was talking about on the radio. 
Well, I was talking on the radio. I was trying to let Taylor know that there's elephants crossing into Juma. And I know she's been looking for elephants all afternoon. And so if she's interested because she's not answering the radio, then she needs to head off towards the Mulawati on Gari Main. And that's where there's a herd of elephants going towards Twin Dams. Towards Twin Dams is where they are heading. There's also apparently tracks for a male leopard in that general vicinity as well but on the southern side on little gauri so it's a good opportunity for taylor if she goes that side we haven't had much luck on chipper though we found no evidence of a leopard anywhere no sign of hosanna not even a track anywhere we've been driving around in all over the place and check things out we went and checked those birds that i'm calling and couldn't see anything they were all gathered in a very difficult place i'm sure it was a snake that was in there that they were busy kind of shouting at and that's why there was so much kind of noise from the birdies that side but since then very very quiet on Chitwa that's for sure there's not really even any impalas that we've seen we had one Nyala just now which kind of bolted into a thicket so not really ideal in this situation oh wait hang on a second there's a water buck now I believe Taylor's wondering about the elephants at Mulawati Taylor at Gauri Main Mulawati you'll find them there they're apparently crossing the road if you just drive on Gauri Main you'll find them but our waterbuck male finally an animal on Chitwa which is nice it's sitting in the very long grass and you we know that waterbuck are not the smallest animals out here and yet look at how long the grass sits on that waterbuck it's a close to its nose and even some of it close to its eyeballs and so a thing like a leopard lying down in this unless it puts its head up you're going to struggle to see them at the moment so it's going to be a tough few weeks with that if we get more rain the grass gets so long and becomes really tough to be actually able to make them out so we're going to have to keep our wits about us and look very carefully as we go along finding all of these cats you can see how this water buck is very alert though So everyone wishes, you're asking about solitary species, if we have any, I, ref, I suppose you're referring to animals in general, or are we talking about maybe something like an antelope? Um, if we're talking about in general, leopards are solitary for the most part, dogs, mm, so no, they, I mean jackals are monogamous, hyenas, which are not dogs, they're in family groups, wild dogs family groups, um, what else? That's, you know, there's, there's no real solitary kind of dogs or dog family. The mongoose are all kind of either in pairs or in groups. You will see something like a white-tailed mongoose um, flittering about on its own, but it will pair up with another one and mate. Uh, what else? I'm just trying to think. Antelope-wise, also again, very few that are solitary. Being solitary is not a good idea. It means that you are far more vulnerable if you're a prey animal, and that makes things a lot harder. Now I'm just going to try and make this big turn. Come on, car. Here we go. There we go. Well done. So, Sid, Animals affected by cancer is pretty much all of them. So most animals are affected by cancer. Um, you know, your dogs and cats at home will be affected by it and then pretty much everything else. I know elephants are affected but not as badly. So they will only be a very few, a very small percentage that will, will die from cancer. But the rest of the animals out here can be affected by it and, and do die from it from time to time. So. It is something that does happen, and, and pretty much all of them. There are one or two animals that don't. I, don't ask me which ones at this stage. I'm not sure. I just know that I've read before that they are. most animals get it, but some can actually, well, don't seem to show symptoms of cancer, but most of them do. So it is a widespread disease, not only in humans, but in animals as well. Hmm. It's all eerily quiet. Feel like something is going to come out. Kobe, who's 15 years old, mange will affect wild dogs. Yes, if, if it gets onto the dogs, they they can suffer from it, um, particularly because they're so socially sort of um, 
closely bonded. They're constantly rubbing up against each other, licking each other, you know, in, in close proximity. And so the mange mites transfer quite quickly. So they can be affected by it. Pretty much any of the animals can be affected by mange. You see kudu, you see impalas, diker, steenbok, um, lion, leopard, wild dogs, uh, hyenas, jackals. Um, so pretty much most things also get affected by it as well. Now I know we're coming up to a little pan that's one of Hosanna's favorite little drinking spots. So I'm just coming to check if there's any sign of him here. It's not very far from the lodge at all. I'm just going to check in all the shady spots. He likes this pan, him and Tingana both often come to this little pan on my right hand side and the last time he came here the elephants absolutely mangled this whole place and messed it all up and made it very difficult for him to drink and so he left here in disgrace and he walked off but he doesn't seem to be here today i want to just check in the drainage line and have a little look there because i know sometimes our leopards like to hang around in the drainage line section so while i head into there and have a little look around let's send you across to Tila McCurdy and see if she's on her way towards those elephants. We're going to the elephants. I raced. You actually would have thought that I was going to wild dog the way I was driving a minute ago, but I'm in the Mulwanti now. We're heading down this way, hoping to intercept the elephants. I'm very excited. I don't know about all of you. I just hope that it's a big herd and Tristan hasn't fooled me and it's only one elephant bull may shed a tear or two if that's the case but it's a good spot to be I'm down on the Mulwanti today nice and cool oh, Monique I'm so happy to hear from you and uh, thank you for showing uh, some love to Maurice because you're wondering where Maurice is for those of you that have absolutely no idea who Maurice is Maurice is my elephant friend that was given to me as a gift by the team for my 25th birthday last year and uh, Maurice is now my safari companion however we think that Maurice would like the water. He doesn't machine, he's so afraid of it. So he stayed at home. Um, I'm next. I'm no, 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 into a better signal area for you. If I don't roll, working. Okay, sorry, everybody. Monique, I'll get back to your question about Maurice. The signal, the gremlins are getting us. Is it getting better, Beck? I'm Bex. So used to having Rebecca directing. Nix? <laughs> okay. Apparently, that seems to be working. Um, so basically, he's at home on my skateboard with a new shirt on. I got We got him a jersey. So I'll have to bring him out tomorrow and then we'll show you his. It's not really a jersey. It's more have a look you can so I shall show you that right so I'll tell you more about Maurice hope forget to the elephants but the gremlins are attacking me so off we go back to brain hi everyone so we're in a bit of a difficult spot here at the bottom of the Mawati River above the dam just trying to find out exactly where those evoker males went. They're not in the same place where they were left sleeping this morning. And it is a little bit of a tricky area. So, duck! As we go through here. So I'm just going very, very slowly. And so we just trying to find out exactly where these lions went. Got to watch out for the thorns. Oh, our aerial fell down there, Dave. Let's give Dave a chance to put it back up. Oh, and Tristan is calling me now. Standing what? Copy, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave the lines in. I'll head in that direction. Uh, lines have moved in, up into those drainages where we can't get a visual. Okay, the dogs have been spotted very close to our boundary. Oh dear, it sounds like they're not coming back our way. Gobby, thanks, Trist. Apparently they've crossed from our side into Sibambili. Okay, is everyone holding on again? We've got to go through here. See, I'm not seeing any tracks of the lions. 
down here, but there were vehicle tracks coming through here. So they were around here somewhere. Holding on, Dave. Are we going to make the corner past the stump? We are. So you can see the game drive cars this morning were all around here. So the lions were sleeping somewhere here. But this grass is quite long, and I'm sure as the days got warmer, they have headed into the deep shade somewhere. So I'm going to check a little bit further up towards the top end of the Moati River. While we do that, let's go. Oh no, you're staying with me. We were going to go across to Madame McCurdy, but she's fighting gremlins. Okay, let's find these lines now, Dave. Enough, 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 enough nonsense. Let's find them. So there are some vehicle tracks heading up here as well. Now, fortunately, this area I know very, very well. And I know lots of little secret spots to get into the riverbed and even if we have to go all the way to the other side and come in from Gallagher shortcut I spent a lot of time with Karula, Hosana, Shongile, Tingana, Mvula, Sindile, in Kahumas, Bir Birmingham's all in this area so I'm pretty sure we should hopefully find these lines in not too long so we're gonna send you across to Taylor while I do that As you can see, I'm not Taylor at all. Taylor is still battling the gremlins and Brent is clearly off-roading and distracted because, uh, like I say, I don't look like Taylor. I hope I don't sound like Taylor either. Otherwise, something's gone drastically wrong in the last few days and I might have a little bit of a problem. Maybe the rain has caused my voice to go high-pitched and squeaky. Well, it's not that Taylor's actually got the squeakiest of voice. She's actually but a fairly chilled voice. Now, don't worry Brent, we are having about as much luck finding Hosanna as you are having with those three males. Now, I'm gonna quickly link you across to Taylor because apparently she's got something good and no gremlins. We've got a python, my first python since being at Safari Live. Look how cool that is. It is not monstrous, but it's fairly large, snaking its way through. Oh, that is so cool. That must have been about two and a half meters. I, it's, yeah. it's big. It's not, I mean, it's not the biggest python I've seen. It's actually going up. It's, it's heads up the top of the grass, Seb. Okay. You might be able to see it moving around. There it goes up. And you see it. There you go. In the center of your frame. See how it's moving to the right now? There it's climbing up. Up, up a bit more. You can actually see its head on the, yeah. there we go. No, go up, up, up its head. Okay, 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 there we go. Yeah. How cool is that? Look how big it is. Amazing. I think the biggest one I've seen must have been just over three meters in length, maybe three and a half meters. This is only about two and a half meters or so. <laughs> that is so cool. Not wanting to stick around at all. Obviously coming out into the sun to bathe. Let's see if we can go towards the bank and get another view of it. Wow. Is that the first python in the sand, Sid? That's amazing. I know if Scott was here, he would have wanted to get out and go and catch it. Oh, man. Well, obviously, you can see they're absolutely terrified of us, as snakes are. So for those of you that have got a bit of a, a phobia of snakes, you can see their reaction most of the time. And that snake is much bigger than I am, and it's to get away from people. They don't like us. They're terrified of us. It's just sometimes if you corner them like any animal, it's natural defenses, of course, to attack you. Short and sweet sighting, though. We're not going to bother it anymore. Well, we can't get in there anyways, but it's obviously showed us that it was unhappy. Wow, wee! That was amazing. I haven't seen a python in a very, very long time. Right. Uh, well, since being back in South Africa. Since in South Africa, I haven't seen one for a while. We're going to head towards the elephants, which we saw. They've gone up towards Twin Dams Road, so we'll catch them up there. Off you go to Tristan, who basically helped us find the snake. Well, not really, Taylor. I just told you where to go for elephants, and you got 
your eagle eyes spotted the python so that's very very cool we were actually how weird is that that we were talking about a python in the drainage line behind chitwa that there could be it's a good place and good weather for them and then taylor got one and pythons these days are so rare we hardly see them anymore that's very very cool i don't know i hope it was a quite a big one sometimes you get these massive pythons they're amazing to see i actually have seen luckily you have been fortunate enough to see quite a few big pythons in the Savi sands unfortunately the two of them that i have seen have both ended up as leopard snack one by tingana and the other one from a male down in the south of the Savi sands well hyenas and a male leopard together but we've ended up at chitra dam and and so we have decided because hosana is not coming to us or is uh, we can't find him we're going to let him come to us it's a plan that works at chitra dam sometimes is just to sit and be patient and enjoy the hippos and enjoy the sights of chitra it's a beautiful afternoon is this another little baby croc right here it looks like it. it's just here on the edge of the water well, do you see where the stump is just to the right of the stump it looks like a little baby crocodile another one just to the right there right right there uh, what is that it is another baby crocodile so there's another one which is a very cool so that's the third one and apparently there were four in total at the beginning and so we found three of the four but this one looks much much smaller i agree nikki i think this one looks a lot smaller than what the other one did so maybe it's just because most of its body is underwater but how cool is that it's very difficult to spot these little guys sometimes you just see the eyes and a little nostril sticking up and this is very cool i'm actually loving these little crocodiles that are around they're super cool to watch and the one that we saw earlier was a little bit more kind of exposed than this guy but it's in a perfect place it's kind of found itself sitting between this island and the main bank and there's a little bit of a kind of flow that's coming through there so this will probably have and a bit of vegetation so maybe a really good place for little frogs to congregate as well as insects and that's probably what it's feeding off but how cool is that little beady eye looking at us in that cold blue water that it's got it really looks very very cool so nice that's a nice little find i think taylor had a baby croc the other day and it's really cool to have crocs around and i was just saying sometimes at chitra dam you've got to just enjoy it and sit and be patient and things then start to happen for you so that's what we're going to try and employ now when i these baby crocs are i mean in terms of their total length if we take their heads plus their bodies and tail i would say probably if we take this they would be to about there that would be about the length of these baby crocodiles at the moment with the tail but the heads are about the size of my hand and then the body and then the tails to there they're tiny little things they're still very very small they've only been born they well they're not even i would say about seven months old yet they're probably about five six months old and so they've got a long way to go in life if you remember that these species can live to 80 years and so it's a long 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 way to go until they become the massive ginormous big crocodiles that we see in the mara and also in terms of vlad or boris in, that we see here now will you have you spotted something vm has spotted something that is moving around on the ground here ah there is a bird a three-banded plover that is moving around i just know when vm shifts in his seat that he has seen something so i always just wait for him to move the camera so that i can kind of see what he's found and vm's got a great set of eyes often spots things that i miss so it's it's always a pleasure working with vm and a little three-banded plover is being very hyperactive and moving all over the place at the moment so nice to have a few birdies around as well so maximus crocodiles while they do have hearing it's not great hearing you must remember that they spend a majority of their time in water and hearing becomes a bit of a problem in water as you know if you've ever been underwater and you go down there you can't hear nearly as much and so they rely more on their eyesight remember that they're hunting mostly things that are above the surface of the water particularly when they get bigger they're going to start targeting things like the egyptian geese small antelope and well as we know it can go up as big as giraffe even but they have rely on their eyesight more than anything if you look at the size of their eye in comparison to even their nostrils and their and their ear um, canals they're much much bigger and so their main sense is those eyes and they have very good eyesight that they're able to watch and see what's coming down towards the water's edge and be able to grab them and 
kind of pull them into the water so it's amazing actually to watch crocodiles you think that their eyesight can't be that good but you, when vlad or, or boris sometimes i've watched them at chitra dam particularly when i used to work here it was one of my favorite things was just to sit and watch and we used to get those crocs and you'd see a nyala or something wandering down to come and drink and the crocodile would just slip in and we'd see it sometimes from across the dam which is a very long way away so they're very perceptive of the environment using their sense of sight that's their main kind of sense that they use so child of the universe as we were saying the crocs will go after pretty much anything they're quite opportunistic at this age they will go for insects they will go for small fish frogs um, birds if they can get them anything really anything that's edible well is small enough that it is made of meat and can be eaten they will go for so it's a pretty opportunistic diet but insects will form a large portion of it as well as frogs and, and very small fish as well they won't be obviously going after things like an impala they're far too small to be able to bring that down but for now all of those smaller little things will easily be edible by these guys and they'll have a field day hunting all kinds of insects amongst the vegetation right well we'll sit at chitwa a little bit longer i want to just listen out maybe we get an alarm call or some sort of sign that there's a leopard about and while we do that let's send you across to brent who i'm not sure if he's still tracking those lines but hopefully he's had a bit more luck Unfortunately, no luck yet. They seem to have done a disappearing act. Now, I don't think they've actually disappeared. I think they're, they're somewhere. But these are incredibly street, steep little river systems. And we can't actually get down into all of them. So we're just trying to have a look from above. I can almost smell, I can smell lines, I can smell lion dung, but I can't see lines. It's getting quite frustrating. I'm just trying to think about where to go next. Just going to have a look on this path here and see if there's any sign of them leaving. And there's not, there's not a track. What I'm going to do is I'm going to check a little bit higher up here. Uh, if not, I'm going to go around to Gallagher Shortcut and try from that side. Now, we had quite a bit of rain this morning. And the bush is very clear and clean. And the smells are incredible. Now, Stacy would like to know, does the rain make the animals smell worse? I don't think so. Oh, hello. Well, there's no lines that way, otherwise you would be shouting your head off. An old female Nyala. Looking quite relaxed. Well, that answers my question. Stacy, I don't think so. I don't think it makes them smell any worse. They always smell quite bad. Maybe it gives them a bit of a rinse. So she's looking quite relaxed. So I think we're following the wrong fork. So here there's one, two, three, four, five forks that the Moati comes from. So the, the Moati, when it flows into the into the Vuyatela Dam, is one river. But just above Gallego, there's five different forks that are these steep little rivers. And we've checked two now, so we've still got three more to check. And they're probably sleeping in one, one of those forks. So... I'm going to go check the other three. While we do that, let's see how the python hunter, Taylor McCurdy, is going. A python? Did you say python whisperer? Okay. <laughs> right. We're going to... Oh, python hunter. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Um, <laughs> off we go to Treehouse Dam. I don't know where my elephants went. Well, my elephants. Tristan found them first. Um... We had them in the Wati. It was quite a weird sight. I didn't even get to tell you about this because we had the snakes. So we come around the corner and there the elephants were. They were walking very slowly in the sand and it was quite nice. And then the next minute, this one cow came in from behind. I don't know if she got a fright when she saw us, but she turned and she ran up the other side of the bank towards Mumba Road. And then the others crossed and went up towards Twindham's Road. But do you think that we could find them again? No? I can't believe it. It's just a small section between the Mulwati 
Um, and yeah, anyways, Nikki, you're wondering if they were close to the snake? Uh, not really. They were. I don't think there was a snake that gave them a fright. I think because they kind of looked at us and they went, oh, and panicked, and off they went. They must have been about 80 to 100 meters away from the snake. And I think that, that maybe that snake only came out after those elephants had walked through that area too. Um, so yeah, so I just want to quickly check Treehouse Dam and if there's nothing here then I think we might go back towards Chele Pan. Although it did look like they'd already had a bath of sorts, so maybe they were at Chitwan. Who knows? I don't know, or Baboon Pan, or maybe at Twin Dams and we already missed them. I'm not really sure what happened there, but I can't find them. There was only about five of them or so, but it was a nice herd though. So we will try and go back and scratch there and see if we can find them again. Maybe they just dipped down into the Mulwati. But I thought, why not come and check? And maybe we can get a terrapin to wave at us for a second time today. That would be spectacular. Hmm. Now, this is an interesting one. I suppose we can all contribute here, yeah? even Tristan and Brent. I'll mention one or two. And it's a question from Giraffe Girl about what are the most prominent migrations here at Juma. Probably going to be the bird species. So the barn swallows, perhaps the, the rollers, the European rollers going back. There's nothing here. We can just have a quick glance. No waving terrapins. There will be some of them. Um, I'm trying to think. It'll be mostly the bird species. What about those uh, white storks we saw the other day? Hey, Seb on Bushwalk? Remember, we had a, we must have had, I don't know, however many there were, just shy of a hundred. Yeah, it was a huge flood. Taking up into the air and probably going to feed down in the grass, or not grass, up in the grasslands in Kruger around Satara first before heading on home. That's a fairly big migration. See, we don't have any massive mammal migrations. I mean, there's no big bat migrations like there are in uh, Kasanka in Zambia, I mean the largest, that's, and that's actually the largest mammal migration in the world, I think is with those bats in fact, and then it's the wildebeest migration. In Kenya, in, Zam, uh, in Kenya, in the Maasai Mara and the Mara Triangle, which should be starting in a little bit, when we end of June, beginning of July, we don't have anything like that here. It's obviously, it's a very different type of ecosystem. The animals don't need to migrate, they're just, they do many migrations that they will. They're constantly searching for new food, but not necessarily really, not necessarily traveling massive distances. What else, Seb? It's really just the birds. Hey, I'm trying to think of any insects. No, maybe. What about um, the alates when they're released from their termite mounds uh, after the rains? So the princes and the princesses, and they fly away in search of new areas. Can we call that a migration? I'm not really sure. Well, we can also ask Tristan and see what he thinks. Perhaps he thinks of something different. But we're going to go back and try and find our elephants. Tristan is looking at a green back heron. I am in the most epic light you could ever ask for. This little green back heron is slowly but surely creeping closer to the water's edge. And you can see its neck is primed in order to try and hunt. And so what it's doing is it's going and it's using a very similar tactic that I think this little crocodile would be using. It's waiting for little fish and things that are funneling in between the island and it can then strike out with that long neck. And you'll be surprised how long this neck is on this bird. It looks like it's got a little stubby short neck, but when they go for something, you'll see it'll fly out and extend almost the length of its body into the water where it'll stab fish and then bring them back and swallow them. So you just have to be patient with these guys because they sit so still and they wait and they wait and they wait and then if they feel like the fish are just getting out of range a bit they'll take another step forward slowly and try and just get a little closer and then all of a sudden they'll dart it in again so they are incredibly patient animals and they'll wait and wait and wait until they get close enough but the light on this particular heron is absolutely amazing it is that golden afternoon light and the reflection from that cool blue water is perfect no nope, it's decided not there got a reposition see how it keeps its body low it's just like a leopard in so many respects they kind of keep their body right down so as not to make too much of a shadow on the water and then the feet go slowly but ever so kind of purposefully back in towards the water it's amazing to watch them we were thinking for a second there can you imagine if it was a bigger heron this little crocodile might have been in trouble you might have seen a situation where Something like a grey heron or one of those saddled storks. I wonder if they would go after the croc. I'd imagine they would. Now, look at that focus though. You see how the eyes are pinned? Let's see. It looks like it might go forward. There we go. 
big feet that distributes the weight evenly. Here we go. How cool is this? So it's just stalking closer and closer towards the edge. Is it going to go? This is so cool. <laughs> Uh, the green bacterians at Chitwa have got to be one of my favorite things to follow. The way that they move like this is just always so interesting. It's this time of the day that they do it, so I absolutely love it because if you sit for a long period of time, they actually come to you and because they, they move away around the bank and around the edge of the water, and they often will get within close range that you can watch this kind of behavior. That's something we don't get to see that often. It looks like it's almost ready to go. You see how it's kind of rocking forward a bit? Now let's see. Imagine all those muscles are primed. It's just like a cat hunt. It's the same thing. Every little muscle will almost be twitching as it waits, hoping that something's going to come close enough for it to strike. Look, it looks like it's going to... No, it's going... There. Did it get something? Yes, it, did. it got something. Did you see that? It looked like maybe something small. I don't know if it was a fish or a little frog, but it definitely got it. But did you see how it's almost exactly like a cat in the way that it goes forward two steps and then whack, it just happened. So it hits it with a beak. But it's not finished hunting yet. Hunting time is still on. It's still coming towards us. And that's a very cool view of a heron walking straight towards us not every day you get that kind of a view of a bird and it's like a prowling cat it's the same thing head is down and its feet slowly moving such a cool view of a bird and we've struggled with all the animals but the birds have certainly been on display today we've had some amazing kind of sightings of birds i know some of them are just generic and i know a lot of people aren't hugely into birds but when you watch them like this and you see the way they go about things it's very difficult not to kind of start to get interested in them and you can't help but feel gripped in a situation like this when a heron is busy stalking it seems like it's struggling to get whatever it was down you can see it's still trying to sw swallow a little bit it's not mean it's stopped hunting yet it's still trying to go for it so Gemma you say wow that was quick exactly you blink and you'll miss it it's amazing how fast these guys are and that's the thing about them is you've got to be patient with them you've got to just sit and when it happens it is absolutely incredible to watch how quickly they go for it and how efficiently they they do it it's very seldom that they miss they probably I would say have at least in the times that I've watched them here at Chitra maybe a 50-60% hit rate which if you think about the cats is a lot more than them so efficient and effective hunter and they love these sort of areas where there's a bit of vegetation because of all the animals that will be hanging around there so reptilian research you saying can you believe that we just saw that live it's amazing isn't it it just goes to show you what a bit of patience can do at a waterhole it's why a lot of people do go to waterholes and just spend all their time there and the fact that we are able to show you a bird hunting live is a very special thing it's not something that you get to see every day and it's the second time i've gotten these green bacteria and i think maybe even the third time that i've gotten a green bacteria and hunting and actually being successful so very cool to see hopefully it will continue to hunt and we'll be able to see it maybe grab something slightly larger that we can actually see it kind of wiggling it and, and flapping with it or holding it while it flaps around because then it gives you a better idea of some of the prey they can go for and they sometimes grab quite large fish you'll be surprised at how big some of the fish are that these guys can actually pull out but isn't that beautiful with the greens and the blues now here it comes again so first lady the green bacterians will nest in trees and will well not nest in trees but they'll live in trees so as soon as it gets dark you'll find they fly up into a tree and that's where they stay for the night they would be very susceptible to predation if they stayed on land they are quite a small bird and so a number of different predators would be there now behind them is a little sandpiper that's busy coming our way i just want to quickly id which sandpiper it is because it's kind of bobbing through and i haven't had a proper look so it looks like a wood sandpiper that is just coming behind them, I think. So it's got the big white supercilium. Now, I always, for some reason, get super kind of confused between the wood and the marsh sandpiper. And I don't know why it is. I shouldn't be able to. I shouldn't be always. I shouldn't get them wrong. But I think in this case, I actually might be wrong. Let me just double check quickly. So... 
no, it is a wood sandpiper, so I am right. The marsh sandpiper is slightly bigger than that. So it was, now we've got herons being disturbed by sandpiper. It's a standoff. The sandpiper has decided, nope, not getting involved in the hunting heron, and I'm going to go the other way. But the light on these two birds is just so great with the greenery of those plants and the blues and the dark earthy tones of the sand. It's a very, very pretty picture. But look at that. That's very cool. Just hiding in amongst the vegetation, waiting very patiently. Now, we'll sit here with this little heron a little longer. Maybe it'll keep hunting and maybe we'll get another shot at it going after something. And while we do that, let's send you across to Brent and see if he's had an easing in his frustrations by trying to find those male lions. There, there, there. Well, not yet. These lions are here, that I'm convinced of. But where exactly is another story. So what we we're going to do is be doing a big loop around just to make sure their tracks have not crossed out of the area we think they're in. And I'm going to go across to the other side of those little rivers and try from there. There's some access points there that you can't access from this side. So that's our plan. And I'm hoping they'll just be lying out in the open. Oh, Diker just dashed across the road and keeps dashing. Now, after the rain, a lot of animals will start scent marking again. And Gemma was asking particularly, will cats come scent mark their territories again? Yes. Uh, male lions, male leopards, female leopards will all uh, normally go on a bit of a patrol uh, and re-scent mark some of the, the more prominent boundaries. Uh, it all also depends on the other cat movement. So Tundi, for example, I don't think is going to make a big push uh, to scent mark uh, around the Mawati and towards uh, Treehouse Dam in that area uh, because of Hukumuri um, while she's still got that little one. Okay, are you holding on, David? Bumpity bumpity this section. You can see no one is driven along here on the fire break. So if there are tracks, we should spot them with relative ease. I don't think they've moved very far. It's been quite warm today. Oh, hold on. And uh, we are heading straight into the sun to the west. Now let's go across to Taylor. And let's hope that Python doesn't wiggle into her bed. I hope Python wiggles into my bed. That would be terrible. I don't think they'd be very good at cuddling, in fact. Anyways, so down we go, Batelier Road, um, hoping to find I don't know what, because I, my elephants have vanished. So I don't know if they changed direction and went east as they followed that cow that got a fright and ran away from us. It was quite funny, in fact. I didn't know we were so scary. I always, always find it quite funny when an animal gets a fright of us, because I'm like, you should even... Just imagine how we feel when we come around the corner and we see a herd of elephants or we see a lion. Like, you definitely do jump in your skin slightly. So, Battalia Road is also the only road I've ever seen a serval on since I've been at Wild Earth. So I always come and check it, and this is a great time now as the light starts to turn that beautiful golden color. The temperature is dropping quite nicely. Actually, Nikki, what is, do you know what the temperature is now? I know it was, what, 88 degree Fahrenheit, 31 degrees Celsius. Nikki's going to Google the answer. Oh, very nice. Seems as though some snacks that are going to be happening in FC today. It's good. Maybe some popcorn, perhaps some canapes. Hey, maybe. Yeah, some people have a good life, hey, Seb? Says we, and we're the ones driving around here on your safari. <laughs> uh, I want to know what the snacks are. We need to get a snack update, though, once Alicia comes back from the kitchen. Whether it's going to be popcorn, chocolate. I think, I think Alicia's bringing, bringing back some chocolate. Oh, apparently the temperature's only dropped by a degree Celsius. That's not much at all. Hi, Nyala. We'll stop here. Hi guys, don't run away. <laughs> Every time I say hi like that, everybody goes hi Cheryl to me on the radio. Because that one time that apparently I sounded like a Santon poppy. 
and um, said to Cheryl, I was obviously very hyperactive that day. If Cheryl, if you're watching, hi girl, <laughs> these are Liniana. They don't speak like that, like they're of Santon Poppy from Johannesburg. They don't say much at all in terms of English. They tend to stay as quiet as possible as an antelope should to not be spotted by the leopards. Now, great to always have a Nyala around, and we know that they like to hang around these sort of thicketed areas. And it's always good to, well, I suppose in your head as you are driving around, keep a, 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 a marker where you have seen certain antelope species because if you do hear alarm calls later in the drive, at least you sort of know. And between the bushbuck, the kudu, and the nyala, I think their calls sound fairly similar. But as you start to go, well, you guide longer and longer, their calls tend to sound very different, in fact. The kudu bark is very deep. And so is an Inyala's, but not quite as gruff. Off they go. So now I'll remember, if we hear Inyala barking in this area, we know exactly where to come to. And hopefully it will pinpoint the location of the leopard. Not now, though. We're still looking for the serval, because this is the area where I saw the serval. In fact, it was so cool. With Brian or Viam. I can't remember who was on camera with me. It was one of them, though. But it was amazing. It was so quick. Birds were going crazy. It was actually the birds that were alarming that pointed us in its direction, as that's the case most of the time with snakes, with all the different things.